One of the reasons why love is so tricky for us is that it requires us to do something we really don't want to do, which is to approach another human being and say, I need you. I wouldn't really survive without you. I am vulnerable before you. And there's a very strong impulse in all of us to be strong and to be well defended and not to reveal our vulnerability to another person. Psycho psychologists talk of two patterns of response that tend to crop up in people whenever there's a danger of needing to be extremely vulnerable, dangerously vulnerable and exposed to another person. The first response is to get what, what um, uh, psychologists call anxiously attached. This is attachment theory some of you may know. So when you are anxiously attached to somebody, rather than saying, I need you, I depend on you, you start to get very procedural. You say, mm, you're 10 minutes late, or I think the bin bags need to be taken out, or you start to get strict when actually what you want to do is to ask a very poignant question, do you still care about me? But we don't dare to ask that question, so instead we get nasty, we get stiff, uh, we get procedural. The other thing, the other pattern of behavior which psychologists have identified, and it tends to apply to people uh, who are in this room, in other words, a types, very outgoing types, uh, strivers, uh, you become, in relationships, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, you become what is known as avoidant, which means that when you, when you need someone, it's precisely at that moment that you pretend you don't. When you feel most vulnerable, you say, I'm quite busy at the moment, no, I'm fine, thanks, no, I'm, I'm busy today. Uh, in other words, you don't reveal the need for another person, which sets them off into a chain of wondering whether uh, you are to be trusted, and there's then a cycle of low trust. So we get into these patterns of not daring to do the thing that we really need to do, which is to say, even though I'm a grown person, maybe I've got a beard, maybe I've been alive for a long time, uh, I'm six foot two, etc. I'm actually a small child inside, and I need you, uh, like a small child would need its parent. This is so humbling that most of us refuse to make that step and therefore refuse the challenge of, uh, of, of love. Um, in short, we don't know very much how to love. We, we, and it sounds very odd, because imagine if somebody said to you, look, all of us probably in this room would probably need to go to a school of love. We think, what, a school of love? Love is just an instinct. No, it's not. It's a skill, and it's a skill that needs to be learned, and it's a skill that our society refuses to consider as a skill. We are meant to always just follow our feelings. If you keep following your feelings, you will almost certainly make a big mistake uh, in, in your life. What is love? Ultimately, love, I believe, is something, first of all, there's a distinction between loving and being loved. We all start off in life by knowing a lot about being loved. Being loved is the fun bit. Uh, that's when somebody brings you something on a tray and asks you how your day at school went, etc. And we grow up thinking that that is what's going to happen in an adult relationship. We can be forgiven for that. It's an understandable mistake, but it's a very tragic mistake. And it leads us not to pay attention to the other side of the equation, which is to love. And what does it really mean, to love? To love, ultimately, is to have the willingness to interpret someone's, on the surface, not very appealing behavior in order to find more benevolent reasons why it may be unfolding. In other words, to love someone is to apply charity and generosity of interpretation. Most of us are in dire need of love, because actually we need, to be, we need to have some slack cut for us, because our behavior is often so tricky that if we don't do this, uh, we wouldn't get through uh, any kind of relationship. But we're not used to thinking that that is the, co the core of what love is. The core of what lo love is is the willingness to interpret another's behavior. Um, wh what we tend to be very bad at is recognizing that anyone that we can love is going to be a perplexing mixture of the good and the bad. There's a wonderful uh, psychoanalyst called Melanie Klein, who was active in the 50s and 60s, originally from Vienna, uh, active in North London, studying how children learned about relationships from the parental situation. And she came up with a very fascinating analysis. She argued that when children are small, very small, they don't really realize that a parent is one character. They actually do what she calls split a parent into a good parent and a bad parent. And so this is when a, a baby is you know, really at infant stage. So what you do is you split into the good mother or, and the bad mother. And it takes a long, long time. Melanie Klein thought it might be until you're four, um, until you actually realize that the good and the bad mother are one person and you become ambivalent. In other words, you become able to hate someone and really go off them and at the same time also love them and you're able not to run away from that situation. You're able to say, I love someone and hate them and that's okay. 
Uh, and Melanie Klein thought this is an immense psychological achievement when we can no longer merely divide people into absolutely brilliant, perfect, what marvelous, and hateful, let me down, disappointed me. Everyone who we love is going to disappoint us. We start off with idealization, and we end up often with denigration. The person goes from being absolutely marvelous to being absolutely terrible. Maturity is the ability to see that there are no heroes or, or sinners, really, among human beings, that all of us are this wonderfully perplexing mixture of the good and the bad. And adulthood, true psychological maturity, and you may need to be 65 before it hits you, I'm not there yet, uh, is the capacity to realize that anyone that you love is going to be this mixture of uh, uh, the, 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 the good and the bad. So love is not just admiration for strength, it is also tolerance for weakness, and recognition of ambivalence. Um, the reason why we're going to probably make some real mistakes when we choose our love partners, some of you in this room have made some stunning mistakes. Now, why is this? The reason is that we've been told that the way to find a good partner is to follow your instinct, right? Follow your heart. That's the mantra. And so we're all the time reminded that if we stop uh, reasoning, analyzing, by the way, are there people in this room who think that you can think too much about your emotions? You know, that sort of view, people go, yeah, you can think too much. A few people, okay, I, you can't think too much. You can only ever think badly. Uh, but there's no such thing as thinking too much about emotions. But the problem is we live in a romantic culture that privileges impulse. Now, when it comes to love, something tricky occurs because... You don't have to be a paid-up believer in psychotherapy or psychoanalysis to realize that the way we love as adults sits on top of our early childhood experiences. And in early childhood, the way that we learned about love was not just via experiences of tenderness and kindness and generosity. The love that we will have tasted as children will also be bound up with experiences of being let down, being humiliated, maybe being with a parent who uh, treated us very harshly, who scolded us, who made us feel small in some way. In other words, quite a lot about our early experiences of love are bound up with various kinds of suffering. Now, something quite bad happens when we start to go out into the adult world and start to choose love partners. We think we're out to find partners who will make us happy, but we're not. We're out to find partners who will feel familiar. And that may be a very different thing, because familiarity may be bound up with particular kinds of torture. And this explains why sometimes um, people will say to us, look, there's a wonderful person, you should go and date them, they're, 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 they're good looking, they're charming, they're all sorts of things. And we go out with them and we date them. And we do recognize that they're, they're really wonderful and amazing. But we have to confess to our partners, that, to, to our friends, that actually we found this person, often we struggle with the vocabulary. We say, maybe not that exciting, or maybe not sexy, or a bit boring, but really what we mean is that we've detected in this really quite accomplished person someone who will not be able to make us suffer in the way that we need to suffer in order to feel that love is real. And that's why we reject them. So we are not merely on a quest to be happy. We are on a quest to suffer in ways that feel familiar. And this radically undermines our capacity to find a, a good partner. Here's another reason why we're going to come unstuck in the field of love. We tend to believe that the more a lover is right for us, the less we're going to have to explain about who we are, how we feel, what upsets us, what we want. We believe, rather as a young child believe of its parent, that a true lover will guess what is in our minds. One of the great errors that human beings make is permanently to feel that other people know what's in their minds without us having said what's in our minds. It's very cumbersome to use words. It's such a bore. And when it comes to love, we have this deep desire that will simply be understood wordlessly. It's touching. It's a beautiful, romantic idea. But it also leads to a catastrophic outbreak of sulking. Now, what is sulking? Sulking is an interesting phenomenon. We don't just sulk with anyone. We sulk with people who we feel should understand us, and yet, for some reason, have decided not to. And that's why we tend to reserve our sulks for people who we love and who we think love us. And they tell us something, you know, they unwittingly will trigger a negative reaction in us, and we'll sulk. And they'll say, what's wrong with you, darling? And we'll say, nothing. And they'll say, but come on, you're upset. And we'll go, no, I'm not. I'm absolutely fine. And it's not true. And we'll go upstairs and we'll shut the door and we won't tell them what's wrong with us. And then they'll knock at the door and they'll say, please, just tell me. And we'll say no, because we want them to read our souls. Because we expect that a true lover can understand 
what we feel and who we are without us speaking. This is a catastrophe for our capacity to form lasting relationships. If you do not explain, you can never be understood. The root to a good marriage and to good love is the ability to become a good teacher. Now, teaching sounds like a narrow profession. Those guys in tweed jackets and fusty with a, with a chalkboard, etc. I'm not talking about that kind of teaching. All of us, whatever our job aspirations, whatever it is we do, have to become teachers. Now, teaching is merely the word that we give to the skill of getting an idea from one head into another in a way that is likely to be accepted. And most of us are appalling teachers. Most of us teach when we're tired, when we're frightened. What are we frightened of? We're frightened we've married an idiot. And because we're so frightened, we start screaming at them. You've got to understand. And the thing is that unfortunately, by the time you've started to humiliate the person you want to understand something less than over, you will never get anyone to understand what you want them to understand so long as you make them feel small. In order to teach well, you need to be relaxed. You need to accept that maybe your partner won't understand. Um, and also, you need a culture within a couple that two people are going to need to teach each other and therefore also learn from one another. And this brings me to the next reason why you're going to have a very unhappy relationship, probably. And that is because you probably believe that when somebody tries to tell you something about yourself that's a little ticklish and a little uncomfortable, they are attacking you. They're not. They're trying to make you into a better person. And we don't tend to believe that this has a role in love. We tend to believe that true love means accepting the whole of us. It doesn't. No one should accept the whole of us. We're appalling. You really want the whole of you accepted? No, that's not love. The, the, the full display of our characters, the full articulation of who we are, should not be something that we do in front of anyone that we care about. Um, so what we need to do uh, is, is to accept that the other person is going to want to educate us and that it isn't a criticism. Criticism is merely the wrong word that we apply to a much nobler idea, which is to try and make us into better versions of ourselves. But we tend to reject this idea uh, very strongly. Um, is there any hope? Of course there's hope. Look, I mentioned the word good enough. It's a phrase taken from a wonderful English psychoanalyst called Donald Winnicott. He had a lot of parents who would come to him and say things like, I'm so worried, I'm not a good parent, um, my child has this problem or that problem, etc." And he came up with a wonderful phrase. He said, you are most likely to be a good enough parent. And he, it's a relief from our otherwise punishing uh, uh, perfectionism. The good thing is that none of us are perfect, and therefore we don't need perfection, and the demand for perfection will lead you to only one thing, loneliness. You cannot have perfection and company. To be in company with another person is to be negotiating imperfection every day. Um, incompatibility. We are all incompatible, but it is the work of love to make us graciously accommodate each other and ourselves to each other's incompatibilities. Uh, and, and, and therefore, compatibility is an achievement of love. It isn't what you need from the outset. Of course, you're not going to be totally compatible. That's not the point. It is through love that you gradually accept the need uh, uh, to, to, to be uh, compatible. Um, we probably can't change our types, right? So all of us, are prob many of us, are, have got types who are going to cause us real problems. They may be too distant. They may be arrogant. They're going to torture us in some way. Now, friends casually say to us, chuck them, get out the relationship, etc." right? No, I don't, you know, we're realists here at Google, and I'm giving you realistic advice. You're not going to manage to change your type. Let's get that for granted. What you can do, and this is a big achievement, is to change how you characteristically respond to your tricky type. Most of us have formed the way that we respond to tricky types in early childhood. So we had a distant parent. We've now chosen a distant lover. When we were very young, we responded to that distant parent by attention-seeking. We rattled and banged. And now we're adults. We rattle and bang in our own way. And we think that's going to help. It doesn't. It creates a, a, a cycle that's going to be a vicious uh, uh, cycle. It's not going to get us anywhere. It is open to us at any time to have a more mature response to the challenges that the types of people we're attracted to are going to pose for us. And that is an immense step forward, an immense uh, 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 achievement. Um, the other thing we should do is recognize the nobility of compromise. One of the most shameful things to ha ever have to admit is to say, this is my partner. I've compromised. In choosing them, I've compromised. Oh, why have you compromised? Well, I'm not that attractive myself. Uh, I've got lots of problems. I'm a bit nutty. Frankly, I couldn't pull anyone better. But they're very nice. They're OK. Now, you would think, loser. 
It's not true. Compromise is noble. We compromise in every area of life. There's no reason why we shouldn't compromise in our love life. Maybe we're sticking around for the children. Good. People say, oh, they're only sticking around for the children. That's a wonderful reason to stick around. <laughs> why else are you going to stick around? Okay, so let's look a bit more benevolently at the art of uh, compromise. It's a massive achievement uh, in love. I'm going to end um, with, with a, a quote from one of my favorite philosophers, Danish 19th century, very gloomy philosopher called Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard, in his book, Either Or, had a wonderful outburst where he basically said, of course, you're going to marry the wrong person and make the wrong decisions in a whole row of areas. And the reason you're going to do this is that you're human. Therefore, do not berate yourself for doing what humans do. This is what he says. Marry and you will regret it. Don't marry, you will also regret it. Marry or don't marry, you will regret it either way. Laugh at the world's foolishness, you'll regret it. Weep over it, you'll regret that too. Laugh at the world's foolishness or weep over it, you will regret both. Hang yourself, you will regret it. Don't hang yourself, you will regret that too. Hang yourself or don't hang yourself, you will regret it either way. Whether you hang yourself or don't hang yourself, you will regret both. This gentleman is the essence of all philosophy. Thank you very much.